As you, as you are probably all aware, on the 25th of February um, last month, the International Court of Justice uh, delivered its advisory opinion uh, on, on the Chagos uh, uh, dispute, and I'll be talking about that in the context of, of the law of self-determination, uh, specifically looking at uh, uh, what happened during the uh, period of decolonization. Um, and in particular, I'll also be addressing some wider, wider issues uh, and explaining why it might also be relevant to other uh, self-determination um, disputes. And as, I, as I'm based at the Middle East Institute, um, I'll also uh, address uh, another dispute uh, that relating to, um, to, to Jerusalem, which is also currently before the International Court of Justice. And I'll suggest that what the court had to say regarding self-determination um, uh, might be relevant uh, to that case. So um, I'm going to be focusing on the sovereignty dispute, if you like, between Mauritius and the United Kingdom. Um, although I'll make some reference to, to the series of court cases in, 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 in the United Kingdom uh, with regard to uh, a long-standing campaign to uh, allow the islanders, the Chagossians, the Ilwa, who were removed from the island to return. But that, that won't be the focus of my, of my talk, but you need to have some understanding uh, of that to understand how this case uh, came before the uh, International uh, Court of Justice. So I'll talk about the background as well, how the, how the British Indian Ocean Territory was established. Um, I'll then look at the, the voting record uh, for the UN General Assembly's request for the advisory opinion and the question itself. Briefly look at the written oral, arg oral arguments and then um, the advisory opinion before saying why I think it might have relevance to other situations. Okay, so this is a map of the uh, Indian Ocean um, and it, it shows you why why the uh, islands in question are strategically um, important. So this is the Chagos Archipelago uh, right here, and Mauritius is located here. And uh, prior to the establishment of, the, of the, what, was, what was named the British Indian Ocean Territory, the Chagos Islands were a dependency of, uh, of Mauritius. So they were treated in the colonial period as one, as one unit, even though they are separated uh, by, by you know, quite, quite a long distance. Uh, and you can also see it's uh, important for the sea lanes, particularly for uh, shipping of oil um, between Asia and, and, uh, uh, Asia and Europe. Um, and what happened is that during the, uh, uh, the wars in Southeast Asia, especially the Vietnam War, and during the, the withdrawal from uh, particularly France and other colonial powers from this part of the world, uh, the United States began to look for a naval base um, to be established um, to monitor uh, events initially uh, during the Cold War to keep an eye on Soviet um, activity. And they were looking at a number of different islands in, in the Indian Ocean, and, and they, uh, they settled on the Chagos group, and that's when they approached the British government with a view to uh, seeking their agreement to, to establish a uh, military facility on the, on the largest island of the group called uh, Diego Garcia. Now, um, one of the reasons why they wanted, uh, they approached the United Kingdom and they were interested in this territory was not only its strategic location, but also because the territory was um, British. And this comes out in, in, in some of the other papers. They, they felt that the United Kingdom was a dependable ally in good times and bad, um, that they were politically re uh, reliable, and that uh, the UK, I suppose, was more, more pliant. Uh, permission to use military facilities w was unlikely to be withheld, say, in other territories. And we've seen that with some of the military bases in the Middle East, in the Gulf, in Saudi Arabia, in Turkey, permission has been withheld to use these bases. So if you see the reasons why they still, the British government still says they want to keep hold of this territory, or the Americans, is because they, they like the fact that it's a British uh, territory. And, uh, and in more recent times, it's used uh, to, to uh, monitor global threats. So things like terrorism, uh, piracy, and surveillance. <clears throat> 
So in a nutshell, the UK has minimal restrictions on its use, and that's why uh, the Americans are like a territory. So here's a, an image um, of one of the runways on Diego Garcia. So I'll just explain what, you know, what, what the facility uh, is. So the British Indian Ocean Territory was established formally in 1965. So before Mauritius became independent, it was, if you like, hived off or detached from, from the, uh, the main uh, island. Uh, and that is the controversy over how that detachment actually took place in the negotiation that led to that, which is what the, was, uh, was addressed uh, by the international courts, and I'll discuss that later. But just to give you an idea of what this uh, territory uh, consists of and what's it, what it is used uh, for. So it is a uh, formerly what they call a British uh, dependent territory, or you might call it a new colony. Uh, as some of the uh, states did in, in their written statements. It's a permanent joint operating base, uh, serves as a staging area for the build-up and resupply of military forces prior to an operation. The United Kingdom has full and continuous access to the facility under British law. It's considered British sovereign territory, and that is precisely that issue uh, which was controversial in the opinion, and because uh, under international law it's not seen anymore as British sovereign territory. Um, and it consists of a, an air base uh, for the U.S. Air Force. It's used for strategic long-range um, bombers, uh, stealth fighter jets and drones. It has a satellite tracking station. It also has space surveillance. Um, it also has a naval, naval uh, base. It can hold up to 20 uh, warships, including in, in the lagoon, of the deep water lagoon, including... Um, uh, U.S. aircraft carriers, mobile hospitals, oil tankers, and combat force ships. It also serves the U.S. Marine Corps, and it has a high-frequency global communications uh, receiver, things like signal um, intelligence. Now, when the, uh, uh, the British government was negotiating with the government of Mauritius uh, prior to the island's detachment, it undertook to cede sovereignty to Mauritius when the islands were no longer required for defense purposes. Now, of course, the question is when, when, who would decide when it's no longer required for defense purposes. And uh, the 50-year lease was signed between the UK and US governments. Uh, that could be renewed in 2016. That lease was renewed for a further 20 years. Um, Point of trivia, the base uh, consists of, well, it has 150 50, uh, British personnel, about 1,700 US um, uh, uh, soldiers and um, or military personnel, about 2,000 contract workers, mostly from the, the Philippines. And the base is supplied by, uh, uh, from Singapore. I mean, when I say supplied, I mean in terms of civil uh, food, uh, water, uh, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so... As I said, there are essentially two disputes over this, the sovereignty dispute, which I'll be talking about, and then there is the, the long-standing dispute over the removal of the islanders, because there were actually people living on this island before it was turned into a US military base. Um, the descendants of, of, of uh, slavery from the 19th century worked on copra plantations. Uh, there was a village, church, fishing, quite a simple uh, way of life. And between 1967 in 1973, the islanders were deceived or forced onto ships that only had a one-way ticket and which took them to the Seychelles and to Mauritius and where they were just left um, to fend for themselves initially. Um, and then later, as I'll explain, compensation was paid. However, un until now, the United Kingdom <coughs> refuses to uh, allow uh, any return um, of the islanders. However, I mean, so this is just showing you, um, just demonstrating some of the some of the decisions in the UK courts, which I won't won't go into, but just so, so you're aware of them. As long as I've been studying law uh, since I was an undergraduate, uh, this case has been rumbling, uh, uh, going on. Uh, so after some initial success in the divisional court and the court of appeal. Uh, which held that uh, the order which prohibited the return of the islanders was repugnant and that the islanders should be allowed to, to return. This, there was, uh, this was also around the time of 9-11 uh, and the war in Iraq. 
uh, the UK used this arcane method, order in council, and prohibited any return on defense grounds. Uh, this was then challenged in the House of Lords, and basically they lost that. And another attempt was uh, uh, to go to the European Court of Human Rights, also failed. And there's also been, I think, another two uh, UK Supreme Court decisions which have also failed. So in a nutshell, they've kind of exhausted uh, their remedies in the in the UK courts. I've highlighted the UNCLOS arbitration here and in, and the the advisory opinion uh, which, I'll, which I'll discuss because they both touch on on the sovereignty uh, dispute, although more opaquely in the UNCLOS uh, uh, arbitration. Um, connected to this uh, arbitration was the establishment in 2010 of what the British government called a marine protection area which was about 640,000 square kilometers. I think it's one of the largest in the world. Um, this was done by the Labour government at the time. Um, and then a few months later, some of you will recall, will recall the WikiLeaks, uh, when a bunch of documents were leaked uh, to the press, and including cables between the UK and US governments, whereby I think it was the, the British official in charge of uh, administering the Chagos um, uh, islands admitted that or suggested that one of the reasons for establishing the marine protection area was to make it difficult for the islanders to come back. So it's a no-catch zone. The, the idea is that there can be no fishing, uh, no, no commercial activity in this area, with the exception of uh, the island of Diego um, Garcia. So one of the issues that was raised in the, in the arbitration uh, was over the legality of this uh, this marine protection area, and it was during the arguments uh, in that arbitration that uh, there was a which wasn't resolved in the arbitration, but this issue of whether the uh, separation of the Chagos Island, Islands from Mauritius in 1965 was contrary to self determination. Um, only two of the the uh, arbitrators addressed the issue, concluding that it was a violation of self determination. Uh, but the majority said, you know, it was um, that uh, they would not address that specific issue. They didn't have jurisdiction to look into that. Um, and I'll come back to that because one of the uh, counsel for Mauritius ended up got, became, becoming a judge at the ICJ, and one of the arbitrators also was a judge at the ICJ. Um, okay. Then there was a, a so. So behind all these attempts to, to return to the islands, there's also been a, 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 a discussions, high-level discussions between Mauritius and the UK over, regarding sovereignty over the archipelago. Um, and to cut a long story short, those discussions didn't go anywhere. And then in um, June 2017, um, the uh, government of Mauritius decided to, well, the year before, actually, they had um, gone to the UN General Assembly was a request, but didn't put it to vote, giving another year for discussions with the British government. And then when those didn't work out, they then put the request uh, to vote. So on the left-hand side here, you can see the, um, the question, one of the questions, there were two questions. But this is the main question which, which the court addressed. The second question was about legal consequences. Um, and you can see uh, from the way in which uh, the question was drafted is that the focus is not obviously on a sovereignty dispute because then you'd need the consent of the United Kingdom, but it's framed as a, an issue of decolonization and self-determination rather than a, a, a bilateral um, dispute. So it's uh, framed as ending colonialism, uh, which was an issue that the UN General Assembly had a special responsibility uh, for. Um, I've also included uh, the votes, the voting records, so you can see which countries voted against the resolution and those who were in favor. So 94 countries voted in favor, 15 were against, and there were several abstentions. Um, it's quite interesting looking at the vote because you can learn a lot about geopolitics. Uh, if you look at the countries that voted against uh, the request, you can see that they all have a U.S. military basis. Um, so, you know, Afghanistan, there's Bagram, Australia, there's Darwin, Pine Gap. Uh, in fact, all of them, uh, Bulgaria, Hungary, Japan, Lithuania, New Zealand and Korea are home to uh, U.S. military bases. Interestingly, the Arab countries uh, abstained, even though some of them are also home to uh, 
uh, US uh, military bases, so like Kuwait and, and Qatar, for instance. Um, so that might have put them in a difficult position where they were sympathetic with the requests, but they didn't want to take sides. I found Indonesia uh, quite interesting. They abstained. Um, but if you see what they actually said in the, in the debate on the vote, it, you know, it's completely in favor of the request. So I was trying to work out, well, given such a favorable uh, statement, why didn't they vote in favor of it? And then it occurred to me uh, they might have their own sovereignty disputes which could uh, come before the ICJ. And then I was thinking maybe West Papua, some clever international lawyer could potentially frame a question in the form of an advisory opinion. So maybe that was the issue, I don't know. Um, the only Arab country that actually made a statement was, was Egypt. And again, it was very short, saying that as a member of the African Union, they supported uh, self-determination in the uh, Indian uh, Ocean. Another issue I should mention is that, and this was raised by the Americans and the Brits and some of the judges in their separate opinions, is that although the UN General Assembly has a, a long-standing interest in decolonization and in promoting self-determination, this was the first time, uh, so that's June 2017, in almost 40 years that the UN General Assembly had actually said anything about uh, Mauritius and about the detachment. Um, Whereas if you were to compare it to some of the other cases that were cited in the written statements, such as the Namibia advisory opinion from 1971 or the Wall advisory opinion from 2004, in those cases, the UN General Assembly had a long-standing, uh, not just interest, they'd been involved for decades, uh, uh, annually passing uh, resolutions. And also, of course, those territories had a different status as former League of Nations mandates. So one of the issues that was raised is that, in fact, so the British argument and the American argument, I think Australia uh, and other countries made this argument. They said, actually, this is just really a bilateral dispute that began in 1980 uh, between Mauritius and the UK. And they're just using the, the advisory jurisdiction to get around the fact that they can't reach agreement directly. Um, but uh, as you'll see, the, that didn't persuade um, the, uh, the ICJ. Um, and I'll say more about that shortly. So. If you, if you look at the first order that was issued by the court back in 2017, when the court was seized of the, the, the advisory opinion, uh, you'll notice there are two names that were, that were missing. Uh, one was Judge Greenwood, and the other was um, the Australian Judge Crawford, um, who basically recused themselves, or must have recused themselves. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because Greenwood was actually appointed to the arbitration tribunal by the UK. In the end, he, he would lose the election, so he wouldn't um, wouldn't have been on the case in any event. And then Judge Crawford was before his election counsel for Mauritius in the arbitration, and he did not uh, sit in on the case. And he, both in his academic writings and in the case, had argued that self-determination had emerged as a customary norm of international law in the early 1960s that would have prohibited the, the dismemberment of Mauritius uh, in 1965. Uh, written and oral, uh, so the oral arguments that took place in September last year, um, there were also a total of 33 written statements um, submitted to the court. Uh, 25 of those were supportive of you know, um, the request, um, and seven uh, states uh, issued statements uh, you know, uh, calling on the court not to, not to give uh, the advisory opinion, framing the issue as a bilateral dispute. Um, and one country, I put it in another category, which is Russia. I couldn't understand what it was actually <laughs> saying. <laughs> it was a really unusual statement. I couldn't, I couldn't work out which side it was on. Um, but uh, those opposing uh, it was the United Kingdom, France, Israel, the United States, Australia, Chile, and uh, Korea. And as you can imagine, those, those that issued supportive statements were um, well, I can list them, uh, Belize, Cyprus, Liechtenstein, the Netherlands, Serbia, the Seychelles, India, Brazil, Madagascar, China, Djibouti, Mauritius, Nicaragua, the African Union, Guatemala, Argentina, Lesotho, Cuba, Vietnam, South Africa, the Marshall Islands, uh, Namibia, and uh, Niger. 
And then some countries, I think, like Vanuatu, didn't submit anything, but then turned up at the oral, uh, at the oral proceedings. Um, so I just want to say a few things about self-determination um, during uh, decolonization, and then I'll look at what the court said uh, in its advisory opinion. So I've given you two documents. One is the Resolution 1514, and the other one is Resolution 1541. Uh, um, in, I'll, I'll refer to the Resolution 1514 is usually referred to as the decolonization uh, declaration, and this was the first time, if you like, self-determination was given any teeth. So you find the word self-determination uh, twice in the UN Charter, but it's never really um, defined. So this resolution is the first time uh, the UN General Assembly to take steps to define what self-determination, not the first time, but it's the first in-depth time where they really go into more detail as to what they mean by self-determination. But there's also a parallel. Uh, the UN Charter also has its own system, which is self-government, and that appears in chapters 11, 12, and 13 of the UN Charter. And that, 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 that visit, that's more like a reporting requirement, what they call non-self-governing territories, if you like, colonies. There's also trust territories, and they were supposed to, the colonial uh, powers were supposed to uh, give information about these territories to the UN Secretary General and then progressively transfer power. But it was kind of a prolonged, negotiated, discretionary transfer of power. Whereas self-determination in the decolonization declaration is something that is to be granted uh, to all peoples. Uh, so it's kind of more imminent, more immediate. Um, the idea, so it goes on to say, in inadequacy of political, economic, social, or educational Preparedness should never serve as a pretext for delaying um, independence. It also significantly, significantly in uh, paragraph 5, says that immediate steps shall be taken in trust territories and non-self-governing territories or all other territories which have not yet attained independence to transfer all powers to the peoples of those territories without any conditions or reservations in accordance with their freely expressed will and desire without any distinction as to race, creed, or color in order to enable them to enjoy complete independence and freedom. And then uh, paragraph six goes on to say, any attempt aimed at the partial or total disruption of the national unity and territorial integrity of a country is incompatible with the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Now, the language and tone of this document is very different to the language and tone of resolution uh, 1541. And uh, the way I see it is as a quid pro quo. So the colonial powers or the liberal democracies were more in favor of Resolution 1541, whereas the Soviet Union and, and the emerging countries uh, come in Africa and Asia obviously favored Resolution uh, 1514. Now, the question, I guess, is which one reflected international law in 1960? I don't think you can really answer that at that time. However, uh, we know that between 1960 and 1970, when this other document, which I didn't print out because it's too long, the Declaration on Principles of International Law Concerning Friendly Relations and Cooperation Among States, between this time, at some point, self-determination, or, or, the, or the, the language used in Resolution 1514 became customary international law. So if you like, there were two different systems for transferring power to colonial territories. The UN Charter System, which spoke of self-government, and then the um, extra charter system, if you like, under customary international law, um, which was self-determination and that evolved under the practice of states. Um, and I've argued in my own, my own scholarship that probably in 1966, if you could pick a date, I know international lawyers don't like to pick dates, but if you were to pick one or had to pick one, the adoption by the Human Rights Covenants uh, in December 1966 would be a good moment because they were adopted unanimously and they used the language um, that, that they use the same language from the decolonization um, uh, declaration. So during the arbitration, the UNCLOS arbitration, you had a, a, a big a lot, uh, de uh, debate between Judge, uh, sorry, between um, Michael Wood and James Crawford, Michael Wood representing the British government and James Crawford Mauritius over when self-determination emerges customary international law and Crawford for Mauritius was trying to argue it was closer to 1960, and Michael Wood was trying to argue it didn't happen until 1970. So that's quite an interesting, you know, to look at that argument. Uh, and it was, again, exactly the same issue uh, 
would be raised in the uh, advisory opinion if you look at the uh, the British written statement and the um, and the statement by Mauritius. Also, that's potentially um, helpful is that in between, in around 1965, 1966, uh, during the, the moment of partition or dismemberment, when the separation took place, uh, the UN General Assembly got, got involved, got word, wind of what was going on, um, and uh, requested that the, the United Kingdom, the administering power, take no action that would dismember the territory of Mauritius and violate its territorial integrity. And then in another UN General Assembly resolution, it, it actually referred directly to the re resolution 1514, saying that any attempt aimed at the partial or total disruption of the national unity and territorial integrity of colonial territories and the establishment of military bases and installations in these territories is, in, is incompatible with the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. Um, and, and, and in the advisory opinion, we'll see that the, the court referred to these documents and came to the view that they reflected uh, customary international law. Now, um, one thing I thought was quite interesting, there was no mention at all in the, uh, in the, in the advisory opinion or in the um, pleadings of the Southwest Africa cases, which I think is intriguing because they span uh, the exact period in time we're looking at. 1960 until 1966. And not only are they uh, that, they also, the cases or the applicants, Ethiopia and Liberia, directly raised the issue of self determination. And they raised the issue of what they called territorial apartheid, which is their argument that South Africa was establishing uh, homelands or Bantu stands in Southwest Africa, and this was dismembering the territory. And we have UN General Assembly resolutions, very similar language to those used for Mauritius um, uh, in the, in 19, in the 19, mid-1960s. Um, what, what's intriguing, however, I suppose the British government could have made this argument, they didn't, but uh, if self-determination had emerged as a customary norm of international law, as reflected in the decolonization declaration, why did Ethiopia and Liberia not refer to it? in the case. This is the time it's going on. You have this great resolution. It would be very helpful. It says, you know, any attempt aimed at the partial or, partial or total disruption of a territory is inconsistent with the UN Charter. Why, why not refer to it? So it's a bit of a puzzle and a, and a bit of a mystery. Um, one could perhaps say that the case was seen as so controversial that no one wanted to touch it. Uh, and that included not only, uh, that included the United Kingdom today. Perhaps they thought just any reference to that case would, would look bad. But I think as a, the, as a scholar, when you try to look back and think, well, I suppose with the benefit of hindsight, you can say all these countries became independent, and this obviously looking with the benefit of hindsight, it, you know, it's a clear, it's a significant moment, 1960, this resolution, and we saw these countries became independent. And I suppose if you're actually living in the moment, you might not be realizing that this is such a significant um, uh, resolution. Okay. So, the advisory opinion, as I said, was issued on the 25th of February, and I'll just read out the, 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 um, uh, the uh, sub substantive parts of the opinion. Uh, and so it was pretty unanimous. I mean, there was only the US judge voted uh, against the opinion uh, on everything, including, um, no, she didn't, uh, she, she agreed that they had, uh, that, that there was jurisdiction to give the opinion. Um, but on the issue of the substantive issues, she was against it. So the opinion said that having regard to international law, the process of decolonization of Mauritius was not lawfully completed when that country acceded to independence in 1968, following the separation of the Chagos archipelago. And I guess I Judge Donner who voted against that. Uh, in addition, uh, the, uh, the court was of the opinion that the United Kingdom is under an obligation to bring to an end its administration of the Chagos archipelago as rapidly as possible. And again, that was uh, a vote by 13 votes to one. And it went on to say that member states are un all member states are under an obligation to cooperate with the United Nations in order to complete the decolonization of uh, Mauritius. Uh, 
Um, I've read somewhere that someone said that the court didn't say that uh, it didn't address the sovereignty issue, but for, for me it looks pretty clear that it did because it held that it refers to the United Kingdom's administration of the Chagos Archipelago, uh, not sovereignty, and, uh, and insists that it must uh, end that administration as, as rapidly as possible, again, which is a language of self-determination, you know, immediate uh, independence. Um, on the issue of self-determination itself, again, the, uh, the, um, the court uh, was of the view that Resolution 1514 represented a defining moment in the consolidation of state practice on decolonization. Uh, the court said in this view, there was a clear relationship between Resolution 1514 and the process of decolonization following its adoption. And although the resolution was formally a recommendation, it had a de declaratory character with regard to the self-determination as a customary norm in view of the contents and, and, and its conditions of adoption and that it had normative uh, character. Um, yeah, and at some points, uh, the court, in my view, seemed to conflate self-government and self-determination. For instance, at one point, the court uh, referred to Resolution 1541 and, uh, and said this was, you know, this, this was about self-determination, but if you read 1541, you will not find the word self-determination mentioned anywhere um, in it. Um, with regard to the issue of territorial integrity, I thought this was more... This was actually probably the most interesting <laughs> bit of the opinion. Uh, the court said that no example had been brought to its attention, to the attention of the court, which following the adoption of Resolution 1514, uh, the General Assembly or any other organ of the United Nations considered as lawful the detachment by the administering power of part of a non-self-governing territory for the purpose of maintaining it under its colonial rule. Went on to state the states have consistently emphasized that respect for territorial integrity of a non-self-governing territory is a key element of the exercise of the right to self-determination under international law. And therefore, any detachment by the administering power of part of a non-self-governing territory, and as based on the freely expressed and genuine will of the people of the territory concerned, is contrary to the rights of self-determination. Um, now, if you look at the way in which paragraph six uh, of the decolonization declaration was drafted, it's interesting because they refer to previous examples in, hist in history. Uh, so this is the one on, on dismemberment. Um, so during the debate, they referred to Ireland, they referred to uh, India, the Arab countries referred to, to Palestine. Um, and, if, and the British government had even considered uh, dividing Cyprus uh, and had brought the matter before the UN General Assembly in 1958, but there was simply no support for it. So they, they decided not to divide the island. And in fact, the Treaty of Guarantee says that any partition of the island would be contrary to, to that treaty. So you do actually see um, you, uh, uh, there is a clear trend after 1960 where dividing colonies actually no longer takes place unless uh, it is clear that the people uh, involved have expressed their view in favor of division um, in, a, in some form of referendum. This happened in the northern Cameroons and it happened in um, the Gilbert and Ellis Islands. I think there, there, there might be, a, I think in Western Sahara there was a division without, uh, without the consent, but that, that's what the court said, uh, which I thought was, um, was interesting. Uh, again, I would say that um, <coughs> Resolution 1541, which speaks of self-government, isn't so clear on the issue of dismemberment. Um, there is no provision there which says that a colonial power cannot divide a a, a colony, um, so oh, that, that, well, that was uh, worth mentioning. Um, and then the other issue that was raised, and this quite a lot of length actually, uh, in the in both the arbitration and and in the written and oral statements, was whether uh, Mauritius consented to the detachment. Um, so this is a picture of Sir C. Siwasagar Ramgulam, who. I guess was the first minister and the first prime minister of Mauritius when it became uh, independent. Um, but you can see that the issue of consent, it's a very difficult issue, but you can see that it was highly questionable that he, uh, that he was ever in a position to really, he was not in a position to give uh, uh, free choice. So 
uh, for example, uh, Mauritius, uh, had, he had said to the British government that uh, Mauritius would be willing to consider a long-term lease to the UK for the islands. I mean, they could establish this military facility, but the United Kingdom was not interested in a lease. They wanted uh, to detach uh, the islands. In other words, the British government wasn't willing to consider alternatives. And in, furthermore, the government also said that even if he didn't agree, they were going to go ahead anyway and detach it by uh, an order in council. So it seems that they didn't really need his consent. They were just going through uh, the motions, uh, if you like. Now, this raises difficult issues in international law. Uh, people have raised the issue whether there would be duress or coercion, but this is very difficult to prove. Um, usually you have to show that some physical force, a gun was held to someone's head, which is obviously not the case. Uh, and it would be very difficult to prove um, in, in any event. So what the court did is it dodged the issue. Um, and it went and just said, simply said, in its view, it's not possible to talk of an international agreement when one of the parties to it, Mauritius, which is said to have ceded the territory to the United Kingdom, was under the authority of the latter. Uh, the court is of the view that heightened scrutiny should be given to the issue of consent in a situation where a part of a non-self-governing territory is separated to create a new colony. Having reviewed the circumstances in which the Council of Ministers of the colony of Mauritius agreed in principle to the detachment of the archipelago on the basis of the Lancaster House Agreement, the court considers that this detachment was not based on the free and genuine expression of the will of the people concerned. So I suppose um, that's, uh, that, that's one way of, of getting around it. On the other hand, of course, that how would one view all of these agreements that were concluded between um, the colonial powers and the countries that became independent states? Could you say that they were all, maybe you just have to give them heightened scrutiny when you look at them. Okay, so that was, uh, that was really in a nutshell what the court said. Uh, we'll now have a quick look at some of the separate dissenting opinion, some of the declarations and separate opinions. I won't go through all of them because actually they were much longer than the opinion itself. I think the Brazilian judge's separate opinion was twice as long almost as the, as the um, advisory uh, opinion. So the, the dissent, as I mentioned, was Judge Donahue. And again, she said that the advisory opinion, in her view, had the effect of circumventing the absence of British consent to judicial settlement of the bilateral dispute uh, between the UK and Mauritius con regarding sovereignty over the archipelago and that this undermined the integrity of the court's judicial um, function. Um, again, in her opinion, she pointed out that uh, on several occasions, Mauritius had attempted to seek, uh, uh, had approached the UK and had attempted to seek agreement to refer the dispute to the International Court of Justice. However, the United Kingdom had not agreed to this um, and had even modified its optional clause declaration to ensure that a dispute could not be brought um, by Mauritius. And I think even at one point, Mauritius considered leaving the Commonwealth because one of the, uh, it excludes uh, disputes between Commonwealth sta uh, states, the, the original um, uh, British optional clause. But then uh, that never happened. Um, this concern, Donahue's concern, was also, ra uh, also uh, mentioned, or echoed, I should say, by uh, Judge Tomka. And he said he was concerned that these proceedings have become a new a way, a new, uh, now become a way of bringing before the court contentious matters with which the General Assembly had not been dealing prior to requesting an opinion upon initiative by one of the parties to the dispute. However, he, vote, he was in favour of, despite saying this, he voted uh, with the majority uh, on all the issues. And again, he made the point that, that since 1968, the UN General Assembly has shown no interest in this issue. Only now uh, have, they, have they considered it. Um, the uh, uh, Judge Zhu from China, in her declaration, um, she took a different view, and, and uh, she simply wanted to stress that you couldn't view this as a purely bilateral dispute that you know, emerged in 1980, but that this had to be understood in its colonial context. You had to go back to the root cause of the disputes, and that root cause began in 1965 with the separation of the Chacos archipelago. And given the historical background, she said it's difficult to accept that the issue was pure, just because of the lapse of time had somehow evolved into a bilateral dispute beyond the frame of decolonization. So for her, it's really this is really about decolonization, not um, 
dispute. Um, and again, uh, part of the difficulty, I suppose, is the language used in Resolution 1514. Because it does speak of transferring power, it does address the issue of sovereignty. So it's perhaps both, but I guess it's the way how you emphasize it. Uh, judge Gaja, the Italian judge, um, <coughs> you know, also agreed, and uh, you know he pointed out that uh, no program of resettlement uh, of the indigenous population has been implemented. You know, the UK still refuses to allow any return of the islanders, despite you know it's been more than twenty years going through uh, the British courts, and in his view, nothing significant had changed factually in the last. 50 years. Um, then uh, Judge uh, Sebutinde <coughs> from Uganda, um, she just made it very clear that in her mind uh, self-determination had emerged uh, by 1965 and uh, that there was an obligation related to this upon the U UK not to take any measure that would dismember the territory and prevent the people from being able to freely uh, and genuinely express their, their will. She also uh, was of the view that the court could have gone further <coughs> than it did and have, um, uh, in her view, self-determination had emerged as a peremptory norm of international law of a use Kogan's character. She wasn't the only judge to hold this view. Judge uh, Robinson, uh, the Jamaican judge, was also of this view. What was interesting about these two separate opinions is that they also were quite long, not as, not as long as the Brazilian judge's um, opinion, but they and they actually went and tackled the issue of consent. They looked into quite a lot of detail uh, into the negotiations at Lancaster House, which, uh, um, in concluding that consent was was not given. Um, and in fact, Judge Robinson expressed his view that you know we should also look at the UN General Assembly resolutions adopted uh, in the 1950s, and you know. It, he, he favoured the view that self-determination had emerged as customary law even before uh, the period in question, um, although he thinks it was safer to conclude that it, 1965 was the date. Okay, um, responses to the opinion. There haven't been uh, many uh, responses, mostly silence. I was able to find one brief statement by Alan uh, Duncan, who's the FCO minister. Um, who replied to a parliamentary question, as you can imagine, Britain's quite busy now with, with Brexit. Um, but he, he said the following, he said that the, uh, he emphasized it was an advisory opinion, not a judgment, so that it's, it's not formally binding, although of course it's authoritative and uh, uh, will have to be given uh, respect. And he said that uh, the UK would study the detail of the opinion carefully, but he emphasized that it's a bilateral dispute and uh, and that the general, for the General Assembly to seek an opinion from the ICJ was a misuse of powers that he believes sets a dangerous precedent for other bilateral disputes. And then he went on to say that the defence facilities in the British Indian Ocean Territory helped to keep people in Britain and around the world safe and that they will continue to seek a bilateral solution to what is a bilateral dispute with um, Mauritius. So just before I, I end, uh, Brief comment on another potential, uh, another case uh, where, where the opinion might have some relevancy. Um, so the, Israel, for the first time in 50 years, uh, participated in the, in the ICJ case, both uh, submitting a written statement and, and uh, making an oral um, submission, and it, it, it argued uh, like France, the UK, Australia, Israel, Chile, and Korea, that there's a bilateral dispute and not one of uh, decolonization. What's interesting also is the timing because this came after Donald Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem in December 2017. And in the following weeks, uh, certain leaders in, of the Palestinian Authority publicly uh, on, on television uh, went and said that they were going to also refer the issue of the embassy move to the International Court of Justice. And they said they hadn't made up their mind, but it might be an advisory opinion or it could be a contentious case. Um, in the end, of course, as we know, they, they chose to go for the uh, contentious uh, case route. Um, 
and uh, the court has set deadlines for the submission of pleadings to the 15th of May uh, for the Palestinians and the US, 15th of November, to respond. And one of the issues that they have to address or, uh, is, is this issue of statehood, whether they can have access to the courts, whether there are states under the ICJ statutes. Um, and so it might be, a <coughs> it's possible uh, that one of the arguments that might be made is that <coughs> They, well, one of the issues that the, 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 the Council for the Palestinian side may have to do is, is to articulate a narrative of how Palestine became a state, albeit one that is under military belligerent occupation. And in the process of doing that, it could potentially be helpful, the advisory opinion, because of its conclusion that uh, self-determination had emerged as customary international law between 1965 and 1968, because in 1967 you had the June 19 six-day war, um, and uh, you know an argument could be formulated that uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization had emerged as a recognised entity with a right of self-determination. Um, by then, um, in addition, the ICJ also concluded in paragraph 177 that the United Kingdom's Continuing an administration of the Chagos Archipelago constituted a wrongful act of a continuing uh, character under the law of state responsibility. And interestingly, the Russian judge uh, uh, in this connection mentioned uh, Israel's illegal occupation. I was like, wow. So he actually referred to it as an illegal occupation and then cited UN Security Council Resolution 242. Um, and of course, one can think of other potential self-determination disputes that emerged in this period of time. I've mentioned um, West Papua, and I'm sure there are others, if I, if I think about it, that one that might come before uh, the ICJ. So uh, to conclude, although um, <coughs> the, the advisory opinion is not legally binding, but however, it's an opinion that's given to the UN uh, General Assembly. Um, the General Assembly is not scheduled to meet, I think, until the fall. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what, what it will say, whether it will declare, I don't know, that the islands are part of the sovereign territory uh, of Mauritius. Um, Mauritius has said on more than one occasion that they would agree to having the United US based on Diego Garcia. They would be open to negotiations with the US government to keep the base there, so long as that they recognize that it is part of Mauritius, not part of the United Kingdom, uh, but would the US agree to that, or more importantly, would the United uh, Kingdom agree to that? And moreover, there's the lease has been extended until 2036. There have, there have been suggestions in, um, in the press that uh, the US has considered alternative locations, such as the Keeling Islands, which is an Australian-administered territory also in the Indian Ocean. Um, another potential consequence, uh, I think a German academic raised this, was whether the application of the African uh, Union's nuclear-free zone uh, could cause uh, difficulties. Uh, uh, there is a treaty uh, prohibiting uh, the use of or, or storage of nuclear weapons, um, and uh, the UK had a footnote to the map saying it didn't include the British Indian Ocean territory, implying that there are weapons potentially there. Uh, would would listing uh, the islands as part of the sovereignty of Mauritius uh, affect that, or or would would maps have to change and no longer refer to the British Indian Ocean territory? Would it now have to say that it is part of the territory of Mauritius? I don't know, but these are just things that that one could think of. Um, and I'm that's the end of my talk. Thank you.